Hi everyone and welcome to the Penguin Random House Book and Author Festival. My name is Christy, children's librarian at the New York Public Library's Chatham Square branch and I'll be moderating this session Kids Corner Author Panel. But before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. This is a pre-recorded session and it'll be available in the virtual environment for three months. There's now a live Q&A unfortunately, but feel free to leave your comments on Twitter with the hashtag PRHBookFest. I'm so thankful to be able to share this time and space with all the panelists here and let me show you who they are. Today we have uh, Andrea DeBink with the Wild World Handbook, Gail Jarreau with Ambushed, The Dreamweavers by GZ Schmidt, and We Are Still Here by Tracy Sorrell. And with that, let's jump right in. First, we have Tracy Sorrell. She's the uh, award-winning author of We Are Grateful, Ojila Haliga, which is a Cybert Orbis Pictus, Boston Globe Horn Book, and American Indian Youth Literature Award Honor Book, as well as At the Mountain Space, a uh, Isla Youth Honor Book, and she co-wrote Indian No More, which won the Isla Youth Middle Grade category and was the 2020 Global Read Aloud in selection for Upper Elementary. She's an road citizen of the Cherokee Nation and lives on her tribe's reservation in northeastern Oklahoma. Her 2021 titles include her picture book, Biography, Classified, The Secret Career of Mary Golder Ross, Cherokee Aerospace Engineer, and the upcoming We Are Still Here, Native American Truths Everyone Should Know, which she'll share with us today. Tracy, if you'll take a moment. Well, oh, thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to uh, share just a little bit about We Are Still Here today. I'm super excited about this book because um, given my education and professional background, I recognize that there really isn't anything for upper elementary and beyond to have a starting point of knowledge about what has been left out, not taught, and not shared in our national identity in the United States. Because Native nations tend to disappear from popular culture and curriculum around 1900, the book starts in 1871 when the federal government ends treaty making with Native nations and other forms of diplomacy emerge. It's also a time when assimilation laws and policies are in full force, taking Native children away from their families and communities, as well as suppressing Native languages being spoken, being able to uh, practice your traditional beliefs and um, gather medicines, et cetera, you know, just lack of access to places with um, reservations having been formed. So the book continues with an overview of history, laws and policies that aren't in our school curriculums or known to almost anyone in the US except for those families who've lived through the, this. Um, but it brings us to the present where we see a resurgence of tribal sovereignty, language immersion programs, economic development. There's a timeline in the back matter that can be used to integrate what happened from 1871 until the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is adopted in 2007. The US um, would not sign on to that declaration though until 2010 under President Obama, although Indigenous Peoples and others had been advocating over 40 years for it. So um, I chose to share the Native Nations history through that lens of children or more specifically um, why kids are presenting the book. Um, I, I actually didn't choose that, you know? I mean, that's one of the things that you had asked me and it's like, well, I didn't actually write it that way. I wrote the story from the perspective of Native nations and their citizens, showing their agency in spite of everything that has happened to them. The text was already finalized when illustrator Frenet Lessig, um, editor Karen Voss and I had dinner attending the 2019 ALA annual meeting to talk about how to handle the art with the elevated nonfiction text, introducing concepts and events that young people and even most adults had never heard about, we talked about how to help make that connection. So we brainstormed children presenting the information in school, but what children actually learn this? Again, it's a nonfiction book. Um, you know, who's, who's learning this in a school setting? Well, young people attending tribally run schools, uh, public chartered schools that serve uh, predominantly, you know, population of Native students like the Native American Community Academy in Albuquerque or the Sovereign Community School in Oklahoma City would have that educational exposure. So Frenet came up with wonderful depictions that were spot on for each topic. 
And I love the wordless reveal at the end too. With We Are Grateful, I wanted, um, you know, when we look at um, it being a companion piece to We Are Grateful, Ojali Haliga, that you mentioned, you know, that book was for, yes, I mean, the entry point is younger, right? You can be four and up and, and you get a view of one tribe in contemporary life, um, focusing on one Cherokee value across four seasons and how that's manifested in our daily lives. With We Are Still Here, I wanted to zoom out, like what is the larger reality that Cherokee people and all Native nations are, are living under? Um, because I know that people have no idea like what has been experienced as well as what is the current you know, reality and how what's happened previously informs our, our lives today. So we had to target this information to middle grade and not have it as a traditional picture book entry point um, but my hope is that, you know, as students who in upper middle, upper elementary are always assigned units on, on Native Americans, right, um, that they're able to take this and do some deep dives, you know, look in the timeline at, at various things that are included there, as well as topics that are presented in the book, and want to do some more reading and some more research about that. Um, you mentioned Indian No More. That is a book that is historical fiction but it really looks at what happened during um, the 1950s and 60s when over 109 tribes are experiencing termination and people are being relocated off of their tribal lands to cities. You know, we don't have anything that talks about that. So that's like a wonderful follow-up again for middle grade to look at what is this like in the life of a child and their family, you know, experiencing this. Um, in terms of difficulties, you know, making the book accessible, again, it's a very weighty topic, right, to look at laws and policies, history, etc. You're, you're dealing with all three branches of the federal, you know, government um, in this. Uh, the hardest part for me was making the um, history accessible and engaging in terms of vocabulary. So, you know, um, as well as just having so many hundreds of laws, hundreds and hundreds of court cases, and knowing that I can't put all of that in there. And so I come from, uh, you know, a native law and policy background, looking at federal laws and, and court cases that have impacted us. There's only one court case that's included in the book, and that's depicted on the religious freedom spread. So I really looked more at like what's happened with the executive orders, what's happened with congressional laws that have been enacted. Um, and again, even that's not comprehensive because it is a middle grade, you know, picture book. Like there's books that um, I feel like people can look at after this and, and do a, a deeper dive, but I wanted um, an accessible overview. And so, but I did try to put everything in. You can ask my editor. <laughs> we had many, many rounds of editing, uh, not just, you know, myself and her, but other editors at Charles Bridge really looking at you know, uh, who also edit a lot of nonfiction and like, again, how do we take these terms and break them down to uh, that middle grade uh, accessibility point. So there are a lot of legal and policy terms that are just second nature to me, but they're not going to be to everyone else. And certainly things that are indicative of the field. And again, you know, the normal person's going to go, I don't even know what you mean. It, even defining things like termination, right? Termination means right, killing someone. Well, it's not killing someone, you know, in the terms of Indian law, but in essence, the federal government is saying, we don't recognize you as a sovereign nation. We are not gonna have relationships with you. Your land and your resources are not yours anymore. They're not under your control. We're assuming control over all those things. So I had to kind of have a glossary and definitions um, section in the back to make sure that all of that's explained. And um, so I would say simplifying the concepts of vocabulary was definitely the single biggest challenge. Um, thankfully, Renee's, uh, Renee Lessig, the wonderful illustrator's folk art um, style, you know, makes, I think, my words, again, once again, just like in We Are Grateful, Julie Haliga, taken to a next level. And, and she really helps with the accessibility there. Um, I've worked with wonderful illustrators on all of my picture books so far, um, starting with Frenet, who was a veteran creator who you know, has um, 50 books to her credit. 
she is the most humble and um, giving spirit. She made making the first book so fun. She used her own money to come to um, the Cherokee Nation to research the book, meet with people, share her um, sketches, just very open to feedback. It was very collaborative with the community. You know, it's not like just the two of us doing this with the team at Charles Bridge. It was, it was a lot of folks. And, and that's how it was this time. It's just on a broader level of, of people. We organized our own book tour for Ojalia Liga and traveled around for two weeks together in uh, October 2018. So we, we had a blast. She has become a dear friend who I, I love very much. Um, you know, in terms of us, uh, you had asked about, you know, in terms of what if we do another project planned, we don't have anything right now. Um, I've got a full plate. I'm working on writing longer works, which is fun, but it's also a new path. So that's challenging uh, for me, learning new formats and um, like I say, age ranges, but I've, and I've been busy this year homeschooling my son who we had to unenroll from the school district um, because of their masks recommended policy, which did not work for us. So it's been uh, stressful trying to write full time and, you know, just maintain everything. But I'm, I'm super excited about um, having this book out and on April 20th and being able to just share it with everyone everywhere. So Wado, thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. And you answered all of my questions without me having to ask them. I really <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> um, what I, I do have one more question since you mentioned your son. Did you have him um, look at the book before it was published? Did you oh, yes. get his intel? Yes. What was his reaction? Yes, he is a very critical editor. And so he... Um, <laughs> would read through and at this time at the time we're doing this he's um in fourth grade he's now in fifth grade and he says mom these kids on the bus these fifth graders are going to pull out their phones when they get to this part they're just not even going to pay attention I'm like okay <laughs> so we'll read you know I mean you, I always read stuff out loud to him and when his you know attention wavers like I immediately know that section needs to be worked on so he is a pretty brutal editor like he he will definitely tell me when it's not working and so I'm, I'm truly, you know, grateful for that because uh, you, uh, and I actually do mention him in the back, you know, that he's like the best editor because he's just ruthless and, uh, and that's what you need, right? I mean, the, you know, the, he's the age range of children like it, that will be reading this book along with others. And so if he's not interested, no one else is going to be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so the the book is 12 Native American kids presenting their historical and contemporary laws, policy struggles and victories in Native life through presentations. The last of the kids presentations turns to sovereign uh, res resurgence, mm -hmm. uh, wrapping up this beautiful nonfiction title. It starts with a statement on conservation, um, how the Native nations continue to exercise their sovereignty by speaking up for the land, for water and resources that everyone needs to live. And I absolutely love that. But with that, I'd like to turn to our next panelist, whose book is also all about conservation, uh, Andrea Dubink. Uh, Andrea Dubink is the author of several books for kids and a former editor at American Girl magazine. Her favorite way to explore our wild world is hiking a trail or kayaking a river. She lives and writes in Madison, Wisconsin, and you can learn about uh, more about her at andreadubink.com. Andrea, if you'll tell us a little bit about Wild World Handbook. Yeah, so um, the Wild World Handbook is coming out on May 25th this year, and it is actually the first of a two book series on um, environmental um, issues and nature exploration for kids. Um, the first book, the Wild World Handbook, focuses on nine different habitats throughout the world. Um, it was a little bit tricky to, to narrow it down to just nine because I think there's actually more habitats and microhabitats than that, but I tried to include the main ones. And then within each chapter, um, I also tell the stories of people who have interacted with that particular habitat, as well as different activities, um, outdoor activities and indoor activities that kids can do to get engaged with that particular habitat. Um, and then also ideas for stewardship. So ways that they can start protecting um, the, uh, the outdoors, the wildlife um, that's in those particular places around the world. What first uh, inspired you to get into conservation? How old were you? You know, I had to really think hard about this because I feel like I've always loved nature. Um, 
I've just been drawn to it, even though I have to say I've always been a city kid. Uh, I grew up in the suburbs, in a pretty new suburb of Minneapolis, um, and there wasn't a lot of really obvious nature where I grew up. Um, there weren't many trees or animals at the time, but I think I probably started just reading about nature um, through different picture books and um, nonfiction books. But I think it was probably around fourth grade that I really became aware of the whole idea of conservation. And, you know, looking back, I really credit, I think, the scholastic news that we used to get in our classroom. Um, I was in fourth and fifth grade in the mid 90s. Um, so scholastic news was a very big deal in our classroom at the time. And I remember that was the first time that I read about um, what back then we called global warming. Um, and also learned about acid rain and species extinction at the time. Um, and because I really loved nature, I became very concerned about those issues um, at that young age. So I feel like now as an adult, I can really identify with younger readers, uh, elementary school age readers and up who are thinking about these issues and are concerned about these issues um, because I was that kid you know, and in many ways, a lot of those issues that I first became aware of as a child are an even bigger deal now. Um, so um, yeah, that's when it started for me. And I pretty much never stopped caring about conservation and, and environmental related issues. So you in intentionally wrote for this particular audience, this age range? I did. Yeah. Um, mainly because this is my favorite age range to write for. Um, I worked for just about 10 years at American Girl, um, American Girl Magazine in particular, and mainly wrote nonfiction when I was working there. And our target age for the magazine at the time was 10. So pretty much everything I've ever written has been with the 10 year old in mind. And then of course you get younger and older kids as well. Um, and I just love that age. And I think part of the reason I do is because that was my favorite age. I think the year that I was 10 was my favorite age of childhood um, because you're still young enough to really have this active imagination and um, you know, still can be a child, but then you're also able to grasp more complicated, difficult ideas. And you're starting to think about your place in the world in a, in a bigger way. Um, and I just think it's a really exciting time. So that's one of the reasons that I still love to write for that age today. I love that the Wild World Handbook is, has this like tone of helpfulness or ho and hopefulness uh, with activity guides and like tips for kids to promote that climate activism. Where did you uh, get the inspiration for your field trip and DIY uh, guides come from? Uh, were they kid tested and approved? <laughs> um, technically they came from my own mind, my own imagination, um, just because of all the experiences I've had throughout my life um, from childhood to now. Um, being outdoors. Uh, unfortunately, I wrote this book during the pandemic. So I feel like that really impacted my process in a lot of ways. I would have loved to have, you know, kids actually go out and test these ideas and give me feedback, um, but was kind of inhibited just because of the, the craziness that was 2020. Um, but I'm hoping, I have many nieces and nephews, and I'm, I'm really hoping that they'll go out and test these ideas and then tell me what they think for better or for worse. <laughs> I think it's actually a brilliant book for uh, library collections to have. So if we test them here at Chatham, I will let you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Wild World Handbook also features 18 real life stories about inspiring nature lovers, whether they're scientists, artists, adventurers, or activists. And that's honestly one of my favorite things about Wild World Handbook. Um, and I was so excited to read about Junko Tebe and uh, Rue Map. What was the research like for this? And uh, how did you decide on whose biographies to incorporate? It was really hard, actually, uh, when it came down to it to, to figure out who to include, because initially when I started researching, um, I don't know if this is so much the case now, a couple of years ago when I first started playing around with this idea, when I would start researching, you know, the top 10 conservationists in history, you'd kind of get the same 10 people over and over. Um, pretty much a lot of white men from late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and once I started doing that research, it just became really obvious who's missing um, from this part of history that people um, read about. So I had to dig a lot more um, to, to find just a more diverse representation of people who have influenced um, 
our interactions with nature and our understanding of conservation. Um, and it was also important to me to obvious in, obviously include the, the scientific perspective. There are people in the book who are biologists who have you know, studied um, nature in a more traditional scientific way, but I also really wanted to include um, people who maybe didn't have a biology background, but yet their experiences and their interpretations of nature still um, affected the, the way we understand it now. So that's why I included uh, people like painters and novelists and um, you know mountaineers like Junko Tabe, um, just to show that there are many different ways to interact with the natural world and that there are also many different ways to protect it too. That's so inspiring. Did you have a favorite biography that you researched? Oh, that's a really hard question. Um, I feel like my favorite biography was always the one I was working on at the time. Um, he, you know, he's not actually an official biography in the book, but um, I believe it's one of the environmental success stories in the forest chapter. Um, I tell the story of Jada Payeng, uh, who is also known as the forest man of India. And I just think what he accomplished is so amazing. He um, lives along the Brahmaputra River in India um, in a section where there's a lot of river islands. And when he was a teenager back in the 1970s, um, he became really aware of the deforestation that was happening on these islands in the river. And as a result, um, when these the monsoon rains would come and the floods would come, the river or the islands were getting washed away. And then on top of that, he saw animals that were suffering. Um, he saw many snakes uh, one day that had just died in the heat because there was no more vegetation to protect them. So he decided he was going to do something about it and um, decided to start planting trees. And um, this is a spoiler <laughs> for the story, I guess, if you're gonna, you're gonna read it in the book, but he started planting trees um, every day for 40 years. And now there's a forest on that previously just wasteland of an island that is the size of Central Park. Um, and wildlife has come back and it's just this completely different environment. And he did it basically alone. And I just, I find that so inspiring that he just, um, took the initiative to do that and, and just the persistence and the realization that sometimes conservation is um, just a really long-term uh, effort. It's not something that, that just, you know, you can change overnight. Um, it really takes that long-term commitment. And I think he's so inspiring. So he's, he's probably one of my favorites in the book. Thank you. I have to say some of the biographies like really tugged at my heartstrings. I think one of them actually made me cry, um, <laughs> but uh, speaking of interesting biographies, our next panelist also has a very, very interesting one to share. Uh, next, we have Gail Jarreau. She's the author of nonfiction books and novels for age 8 to 18. Her, her nonfiction books have earned the Cibber Honor, Orbis Pictus Honor, Yelso Award nomination for excellence in nonfiction, ALA Notable Book, Notable Social Studies Trade Book, Outstanding Science Trade Book, a NASTA Best STEM Book, the Jefferson Cup Award, the Eureka Gold Award, Society of Children's Books and Illustrators Golden Kite Honor Book, as well as Bank Street, BCCB, Booklist, Kirkus Review, and School Library Journal Best Books and Voya Honor Book Distinctions. Gail, would you take a moment to talk about Ambushed? Yes, um, Ambushed, the subtitle, The Assassination Plot Against President Garfield. Um, I think it's fair to say that James Garfield is one of our least known presidents. <laughs> he was uh, the 20th president elected in 1880. Uh, he was the second president who was assassinated after Lincoln. And yet hardly know anybody knows the story of him or his presidency, which is not surprising because he was only president for 200 days. And 80 of those days, he was lying on his back in bed, uh, the victim of a gunshot wound. So ambushed is the story of that entire saga of the assassination and what happened to him after he was shot. Uh, I, I've written it as a thriller because I realized that my readership, uh, middle grade and high school kids are not only unaware of who Garfield is, but they very likely don't know what happened to Garfield. 
And so I'm able to get away with doing this thriller uh, approach to the story. Um, I give bi biograph biographical information about Garfield in the beginning because I want the reader to know who he was. He was our last president who was born in a log cabin. He was very poor and he was able to rise to the presidency by the age of 49. So his personal story is very interesting and remarkable actually. Um, I also tell the story of his assassin, Charles Gateau, and what motivated Gateau to want to shoot Garfield. Uh, I talk about how Gateau stalked Garfield for several weeks, and then the assassination itself, which happened in Washington in a train station in the summer of 1881. Remarkably, he had no guards around him of any sort, even though Lincoln had been assassinated just 16 years before. After the, he was shot in the back, Garfield was taken to the White House where he was cared for. And the bulk of the story, my book, is about that medical care. This is the second book in my medical fiascos series. Uh, the first one is Blood and Germs, which is about Civil War medicine. Garfield's treatment was definitely a medical fiasco. However, it was a very important moment in history because of the consequences of what happened to him and how it influenced medical care in the United States from then on. We are still enjoying the benefits of that. What inspires you to write a biography about James Garfield or the events that led up to his assassination and death? This, it seems like a very niche, and I have to admit that I, and no, James Garfield was our 20th president, but I also did not know that he was assassinated. It was a fascinating read for me. Um, as I said, it's the second in my medical fiasco series. So I have been on the lookout for medical fiascos that mattered, that though they were terrible, there were positive outcomes from the fiasco. Um, this particular story I found in an old set of American heritage magazines that my mother had. These were bound, um, very old, but I love to look through them because they're great stories in them. Uh, I saw the story about Garfield's assassination and the medical aspect of it. And I didn't know this. I, I like you, I knew who Garfield was. I didn't know these details. And it was really intriguing to me. I have a background in biology and many of my books are about the history of science, um, especially biological sciences and medical science. So this grabbed me and I, I thought it was a perfect fit for my medical fiasco series. And I also saw the thriller aspect to it because people don't know the outcome. And I was able to write it in that way because it wasn't a well-known event in history. Can you speak about your research process and how long that took um, and what, how you decided what goes into the book and what gets left out? Because you include so much uh, documentation and newspaper clippings in the book. Um, the research for this was not easy. One of the reasons I picked it was that I knew there were a lot of primary source materials, uh, but that requires a lot more work too. Uh, I probably spent a better part of a year off and on doing the research. There were road trips, which were fun, but most of it was reading. So for example, uh, I wanted to get to know Garfield as a person. He kept a diary from the time he was 16 years old. And these are bound in four volumes, big volumes. So I read through those and I did get to know who he was. The, um, his papers are in the Library of Congress and fortunately they are online. So I was able to read a lot of that. Um, his letters to his wife were bound and um, compiled, some of them. And I always find that personal letters and diaries are the most revealing because the creator didn't expect anyone to ever see it. So uh, I read through those. Then the trial of Charles Guiteau, uh, 
was published and it's 2,600 pages long. Now, I did not read every single page, but I, I read a great deal of it, especially the parts that describe what happened at the assassination itself, the testimony. And Gateau testified, and I learned a lot about him, the assassin and his motivations. So that, that kind of research was critical, um, even though it took a lot of time. In terms of deciding what to include, certainly I'm not going to go into all of those details. Uh, I read all the medical details too, uh, and the autopsy and the daily medical reports that uh, Garfield's doctors released. Uh, but you know, I didn't include all of that. Uh, I had to be careful about vocabulary. I used to teach middle school, so I have a, an idea of what I can expect um, a, a 13 year old to know. I can't avoid certain medical terms in writing about this, but I can, and what I do is use the context of the narrative to explain it, and I always have a glossary. Um, I left out a lot of the politics. Garfield was a congressman for 17 years, and there were a lot of politics involved in why Gateau was motivated to assassinate him. I had to tell some of that because it was very important and relevant, but I didn't get into all the nitty gritty. That's the kind of thing that uh, an adult political animal wants to read, but not if you're 14 years old. So, you know, that kind of thing I had to constantly keep in mind. And an, a, another part of it is knowing who my readers were. I was able to put in information about Garfield's children. He had five children who were alive at the time of his assassination. Three of them were teens and they were in the White House with him throughout this entire period. And two of them kept a diary. I was able to use that in the book to help young readers identify actually with the situation, thinking about, well, what would it have been like if my father had been shot? Uh, so, you know, that's the kind of thing I wanted to include. And it takes a lot of research to find that kind of stuff. But uh, I, I think it enhanced the book, especially making it more appealing for kids. Yeah, it was definitely a page turner for me. I actually also really loved that the nation, uh, while Garfield was bedridden, that the nation wrote in and followed his progress on the day to day, um, writing in like suggestions about how to keep the, the room cool uh, or sending them, uh, sending him gifts to keep him occupied. What was something that was really uh, the, the quirkiest thing uh, for you that uh, amongst your research? Um, yeah. I wanted part of this story was to, to discuss how the United States public was so riveted by what was going on. I mean, the first thing they do and people would do in the morning is get up, get their morning paper and find out if their president was still alive. You know, it was newspapers uh, and, a weekly, and the weekly magazines. That's how people found out what was going on. And they did write in and they did send things. Uh, one woman sent Garfield some white mice so he'd be entertained in the sick room. Uh, <laughs> you know, things like that were just amazing. And it just how people reacted and they felt as if Garfield was part of their family. And they were so tuned in to everything that he was experiencing. The doctors released all the medical details or many of them. Uh, and so the public followed this. It was like you know, their, their uncle was in the upstairs bedroom recovering from an illness. They were so involved and they did send him things. They sent him food, they sent him uh, alcoholic beverages that they, you know, someone in their family knew would work and making him feel better. It was just a remarkable period that involved the entire country and, and actually served as a healing after the Civil War. There were still tensions after the war had ended and Garfield was generally liked. So it was a healing event too. But considering all of that, he's forgotten and that period is forgotten. And that's the amazing thing, I think. Thank you so much for bringing his, his story back to us. Um, so we have 19th century medical mysteries, medical fiascos, 
I should say. Um, and this is going to be a stretch, but bear with me. We also have the Jade Rabbit, a medicine maker who pounds herbs into a magical elixir with its porter and mestle, uh, mortar and pestle, excuse me, uh, on the moon. Uh, next, we have GZ Schmidt or Gail. Uh, Gail was born in China and immigrated to the United States when she was six. She grew up in the Midwest and the South where she chased fireflies, listened for tornado warnings and pursued a love of reading. In the third grade, she began writing stories in a spiral bound notebook and never looked back. Gail currently lives in Southern California with her husband and their tuxedo cat. Gail, would you take a moment to book talk the Dreamweavers, uh, our fiction, middle grade fiction here? Yes, so the Dreamweavers is a fantasy and it takes place in ancient China and it follows two twins whose village falls under a mysterious curse. Um, and the curse uh, basically uh, is what gets their grandpa blamed for it and arrested. So the twins who are complete opposites must journey together to the Imperial Palace to solve the mystery behind the curse and exonerate the grandpa and save their village. And the book references a lot of Chinese mythology, uh, which I learned as a kid in China. Um, and also it has some historical context, which I include in the author's note. So your first book, No Ordinary Thing, was a, an homage to American history with its time travel. Can you speak uh, about your inspiration behind the Dreamweavers? Yes, so um, the Dreamweavers references a lot of Chinese mythology, such as the Jade Rabbit, as you mentioned, um, as well as the Monkey King. And these were all basically childhood folklore that I learned as a kid. Um, when I lived in China, one of my favorite TV shows was The Monkey King. It was live action and it followed the adventures of this heroic monkey um, and his companions as he traversed ancient China you know, on his quests. And I remember it was, it was my favorite thing and it actually influenced a lot of uh, modern media today too, like Dragon Ball Z. And uh, so that was one, one of the inspirations. Um, the Jade Rabbit was a story uh, told to me by my grandma. She mentioned that on a full moon, you can see the silhouette of the rabbit in the sky. And she told me a bit about the background behind it and how um, he, the Jade Rabbit was basically a medicine maker and had a lot of magical powers. And I thought, you know, that would make a really great story. So I think all of these bits and pieces weave, weaved into the dream weavers. Well, as a Chinese American myself, I loved reading the details that make the story really authentic to me. Was there a fine line between presenting the details like mooncakes and the monkey king without over explaining? Yeah, I think I try to um, both keep it mysterious and also um, give enough context to the reader who might not be as familiar with um, Chinese folklore. Uh, I explain it uh, in more detail in the author's note, but for the actual story, I think I kind of just sprinkled bits and pieces and um, kind of made up my own, um, my own interpretations for some of the stories as well, like the legends behind the rabbit. Yeah, I love that because I actually know a different legend about the Jade Rabbit. Um, but while the Dreamweavers is a fantasy, there are a lot of elements that tie into the historical, like details regarding the Imperial Palace, like the roof over the library. What was your research process like for this? Yeah, so I was living in Switzerland when I was writing this book. Um, and I, I was lucky to have a local university library that had um, books written in English. So I did a lot of my research there, luckily before the pandemic. Um, and I looked up uh, life in the Ming Dynasty, where this book takes place. Um, I also looked up a bit about the imperial court and how the rankings were uh, and how the buildings were set up. And one interesting fact was that um, the imperial library had a different color roof over, its, over itself. Um, uh, the actual explanation is that it was painted, I think, black because they thought um, in ancient China, they said black would uh, deter fires. And so in the Dreamweavers, I made it so that it actually did, like it was a magical element in a whole magic library. Um, and while doing the research, I had to think carefully about what to include. So. Um, 
for example, it's a kid's book, so I didn't really touch on concubines or eunuchs in the Imperial Palace. Um, it, I kept the story PG and kid-friendly, uh, things like that. Uh, there are a lot of strong female characters, and that's one of my favorite things um, about reading books right now. <laughs> uh, is there, uh, and the Dream Weavers actually feature a number of them. Is there a character that you find that is most similar to you? Um, I would say probably May, the main character, one of the twins. Um, so she's pretty stubborn and brash, well, whereas her brother is kind of the opposite, like calm and level-headed. Um, and I, I think I'm more like May because I tend to be pretty stubborn and sometimes I react very emotionally to things. Um, uh, I think it's a gift and a curse, right? So. <laughs> It's good to learn from the other characters as well. Like there's Princess Zaili, who's very um, calm and level-headed and uh, thinks straight more. So I think, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now I wanna move on to my favorite uh, portion of this panel. Um, I'm gonna ask each of you a question and uh, kind of do a round table. Uh, first, we're gonna start off, uh, what's something you wish people asked you? And Tracy, we'll start off with you. I wish someone asked me, um, I would say, um, what's my first love? And so my answer to that is uh, music. I love how music makes me feel this range of emotions in like just a few minutes, whether it's the songwriting or the instrumentation, sometimes vocals. Um, it's like it works magic on me every time. And I love to sing and dance to music. I just wish I could play an instrument. <laughs> It's never too late to start. I know, I know. I mean, how am I going to write songs, right? Which is kind of one of my hidden things that I want to do if I can't play an instrument. It kind of goes hand in hand, so. Thank you. Andrea, what about you? What's something you wish uh, people would ask you? This is a tricky question. Um, I think um, I would wish that someone would ask where I feel most at home in the world, in nature. Um, because for me, the answer for that is really easy. I feel most at home in the woods, in the forest. I've always lived in a place where there's a lot of trees. Um, and yeah, I, I just feel most at home in a place that's really green and growing. And um, it's probably not a big surprise considering what I write about, but um, yeah. Lovely, I really like that. Uh, Gail? Gail um, I, I kind of think about that question of what I wish people would ask me about writing, uh, particularly kids, but also adults that want to be writers, published writers. And the, the question is um, how, how much polishing and how many drafts do you do? I think a lot of people think that the first thing people write down is it, or maybe they do a couple drafts, but then they end up with a finished product. And that is certainly not the case, certainly not for me. And I don't think for most writers that get published that that's the case. I think it's an important message for kids to get, even though I know in school, they are encouraged to do drafts, but not the extent of polishing that I think professional writers have to do. Gail, what about you? What's something you wish uh, people asked you? So um, one question I like answering is, how do you come up with the names for your characters in your books? Because they're not chosen arbitrarily. Um, in my first book, No Ordinary Thing, I named the villain Robert Barron, named after the robber barons of the 20th century, uh, these monopolists who are super wealthy and exploited their workers. And uh, you can see some of that double meaning in uh, the Dreamweavers as well. There's a character named Chef Fun, and Fun literally translates to meal or food. Uh, so little things like that. <laughs> Love that. I didn't even consider that as a question for you. Um, I Okay, this question is however you decide to interpret, but do you remember the first time you saw yourself represented in a book? And that can mean anything, uh, just that you felt seen. Uh, what was that book and how did it make you feel? Uh, Gail, why don't we start uh, with you, Gail Schmidt, and we'll go backwards this time. 
so um, I think the first time I read a book where there was a character that was similar to me was the book The Year of the Boar and Jackie Robinson by um, Betty Bao Lord. Um, and it's about this Chinese girl who immigrates to the US from China and kind of learning this new culture. And uh, although her experience was a little different from mine, because her, her story took place in the 1940s, um, I could still relate to her a lot. And it was really exciting um, and also surprising seeing a character exactly like me in the books. So I, I remember that moment. Yeah. Um, I thought back to what I was like, maybe eight or nine years old, 10 years old reading. and. You know, I don't have a memory of ever seeing somebody exactly like me, but I saw characters I wanted to be. Uh, I loved the Nancy Drew mysteries um, because this was some a young woman, not much older than me. She was really smart. She was really clever in solving mysteries. She was really active. She did it by herself, very independent. That's what I wanted to be. And it was neat to see that well, she was, why can't I be like that? Andrea? Yeah, this was a fun question to think about for me. Um, and I realized pretty easily that the first person that came to mind was Ramona Quimby. Um, I loved Beverly Cleary books when I was a kid. Um, and Ramona was really the first character that I read that I really identified with. Um, and I think it was because, you know, she was the youngest of two sisters. Um, I was the youngest in my family uh, with two older brothers. And I think I just really identified with the idea that she was really well-meaning a lot of the time, but she also was just kind of like a mess at times and like getting into, you know, minor trouble and things like that. Um, and I just, I don't know, I just really resonated with her from a young age. Um, and now that I think about it, I have not read those books in years. So I feel like I need to go back and revisit those. Tracy? Um, for children's literature, it would be reading uh, The People Shall Continue by Simon Ortiz and Cheryl Graves. But I read that when I was in college at UC Berkeley. <laughs> and uh, I also read a lot of uh, adult books and poetry in a native literature class uh, there at Cal also. Um, so it's, it's kind of bittersweet for me because I had like this, these mixed emotions of elation um, that's like, oh, you know, native people actually in their full humanity and talking about experiences. At the same time, profound sorrow that here I am an adult and I'm just now, you know, getting to uh, read and discover these books and that they hadn't been there previously. I mean, I too was a, a Ramona Quimby fan, you know, and, and read Judy Bloom's books and stuff. But in terms of, you know, seeing um, representations from people from my community or others that were adjacent, you know, with similar experiences, that, that really did not happen until I was uh, in college. Thank you so much. As a children's librarian, I love hearing uh, responses to that question. Uh, my final question for all of you, what do you hope readers will take away from your book? And uh, uh, Andrea, let's start with you. Uh, you know, I think first, I, I hope they take away a sense of wonder. Um, I think for the kids who are already um, engaged in the outdoors and love the outdoors, that'll just encourage them to explore even more. Um, but I also hope that it encourages kids who aren't as familiar um, with nature, that it would just kind of leave them with this sense of wonder and wanting to learn and know more. Um, and then alongside that, I also would want them to leave with just a feeling of hope. Um, because kids are very aware, like I said, of the environmental and ecological issues that we're facing in the world. But um, I do really want them to you know, gain a sense of hope from the stories that are told in the book, specifically the biographies, um, that people can do good things on behalf of nature um, when we work together, when we use our creativity, when you know, everybody gets a seat at the table. Um, I yeah, just hope that that's what they walk away with. Thank you. Uh, Gail, Drew? Drew. Um, hope was exactly what I was going to say too, uh, as, but I'm writing about medicine. 
I'm writing about health. And I think because of what we're going through now with the pandemic, uh, hope that things will come out well. And it isn't, it isn't that people can necessarily make it happen, but it does, it does happen. And our ancestors have been through many periods of terrible epidemics and illnesses and not that long ago either. Uh, and yet they came out on the other end. And I, I want kids to know that there is that hope that no matter how bad things might seem, it, it will come out all right, eventually. Tracy? Um, <clears throat> I, what I would like for them to see is that we have, you know, despite what they may not have been exposed to previously, we've never been invisible. We've been active agents and participating in the larger uh, national political, uh, economic, social reality um, since, you know, way before Europeans decided to come here. And, um, but I hope that what they see is, oh, this is, you know, more recent um, that, you know, we're, we're still here and we will continue to be here. And we want, you know, the opportunity to, you know, help everyone thrive. You know, that, that really is um, something that's part and parcel of, you know, our value system but I, and, and so, but beyond that, I hope they're left with a sense of curiosity, you know, and, and wanting to know more and wanting to go beyond, you know, what has not been shared with them and, and look into, you know, various things. Who, who are the tribes for, for students who, you know, are native citizens themselves, you know, like myself as a child, I knew about my tribe. I didn't know about anyone else's. So maybe they're curious about learning about what's happened with other tribes and other locations for students who are not native, you know, from whatever background, my hope is there's more of a curiosity to look at, you know, um, the native nations that are around them or were historically in their area and where are they now and what is their life like now that they went, you know, after removal. Yeah. I think the main takeaway from the Dreamweavers is um, you, your value is not defined by your family name or bloodline, but by the choices you make. Um, it was common in ancient China to place a lot of weight on your family name and who they were. And I think people today sometimes tie a personal identity to that too. They might say, oh, they come from a family of doctors or a long line of lawyers. Um, I think it's important to differentiate between uh, identity and value. So in the book, uh, the twins, Mei and Yung, are from a poor village in the mountains. And when they meet the descendants at the imperial palace, they realize they're not all that different from themselves. And they learn to be more um, confident in themselves. I hope kids would uh, see that too. Thank you all so much. That Those are so, just some wonderful takeaways. Um, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Uh, there's a few, there's very few things I love more than watching an expert work and then being open to answer all of my excessive questions. So thank you to all of you for spending your time with me today. Uh, thank you to Penguin Random House for giving me this opportunity and a special thank you to all of you for attending today. Be sure to check out these four fantastic authors and their new titles. Check out the exhibit hall where you can visit sponsored booths. We have all kinds of giveaways for you. And remember the entire environment is available for three months. Bye.